And friends, before we get started with recording, I would like to mention that um, uh, you use the Q&A box if you have any questions for Mr. Barrett um, or thoughts that you'd like to share you know, exclusively to him. I'll uh, be able to read those and he can also see them. Feel free to use that chat box to talk uh, among yourselves. But if you could just make it, uh, you know, it'll, it's much more user friendly if you, if you stick those comments or those uh, questions using the Q&A box. So thank you so much. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Stamp Chat. My name is Heidi Rhodes. I'm so happy to see you all. And joining us tonight is Mr. Rick Barrett, who is a champion of the APS. And I'm always so thrilled to have him on because of his enthusiasm, not only for the APS, but for the hobby. So it's a real treat. And I'm, and I'm very happy that he's joining us. Rick Barrett has collected stamps for 50, over 50 years and has been an American Philatelic Society member for nearly 40 of them. He, is, he has a ver variety of interests and is a big supporter of the APS and the American Philatelic Research Library. And one of his energetic talks last year won an APS Chatty Award, which you can see on the Stamp Chat's YouTube channel. Uh, you can also find it on stamps.org. Mr. Barrett is the author of Buffalo Cinderella's and the book is available from the APS or on Amazon or eBay. It was, it's won two gold medals for philatelic literature and includes some fascinating history and philatelic reading. Tonight he'll share with us his joys of both stamps and research and how you can too. He's also happy to answer any questions you may have at the end. So just send them in the Q&A box. Today's Stamp Chat is sponsored by the American Philatelic Research Library. The APRL is one of the largest philatelic libraries in the world with four miles of books, journals, and more. The APRL is your source for philatelic research and learning. APS members have access to the library and our staff is available to assist you along the way. Make your mark today by adopting a book and supporting the digitization of reference materials so that philatelists around the world have access to books and journals they need. The Adopt-A-Book program preserves the past for the future. Visit stamps.org to learn about the Adopt-A-Book campaign. And now, without further ado, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, our feature presentation, Adventures in Philatelic Publishing. Thanks, Rick, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Heidi. It's great to see you. And I am so honored to be with the APS and all the people that are here tonight. I hope you enjoy our time together. As Heidi mentioned, tonight's topic is Adventures in Philatelic Publishing. And uh, let's hope that it's informational and a little bit in experiential from this end. It's definitely a travel log, and it, hopefully it encourages involvement in our hobby. So let's start things off. From about age 10 to about 50 years old, I was a passionate collector who enjoyed getting stamp magazines all the time. And I would buy things by mail and put them in my album or stock books or uh, simply toss them in boxes and look for some more cool things to buy. And then about 20 years ago, I had this very small idea about creating a 16-page philatelic pamphlet, and it morphed into a full-fledged six-year project that resulted in my book, Buffalo Cinderella's. And that's what I'd like to talk about today, that what an amazing, exciting, and unexpected odyssey that the whole project has been, and it's involved travel, research, and philatelic discoveries. Through it all, I met over 100 people, and I wanna emphasize that everybody that I met was friendly, they were pleased to hear about my project. I really didn't anticipate that, but it was a wonderful experience. Uh, whoever could help me was happy to do so, and those who couldn't did their best to guide me elsewhere. And it was also wonderful to experience some unforeseen miracles along the way, which were a real joy when they occurred. And I wanna share a couple of those uh, tonight as well. So, and through it all, not only did my connection to our hobby get much larger, but my life got bigger too. 
So it started, as I mentioned, when I thought of some of the stamps that I love to collect, and these are poster stamps or labels, now called Cinderella stamps, that pertain to the 1901 Pan American Exposition held in Buffalo, New York. The ones on the left are from a set called the Building Set or the Building Series, and then the ones over on the right are from another fellow, uh, and this is Niagara Falls and the Bridge and Whirlpool at Niagara Falls. For the most part, uh, at least the left uh, image and the center image, those are pretty easy to find, uh, even just for a few dollars. Uh, some of them might go up as high as $10. Um, but the ones on the, the right side, they're a little bit tougher, but this is what I collected and I wanted to create a pamphlet and a numbering system so that other collectors could enjoy putting sets together, whatever that might be. And so the Pan American Exposition was really a big deal. It was a world's fair held in Buffalo from May 1st, 1901 until November 2nd, 1901. And over 8 million people came to the grounds of the Pan Am. It was really a beautiful site, a, a wonderful um, setting just north of downtown Buffalo. And uh, people came from all around the country. And it was just a, a, a wonderful success. And uh, nearby, about 30 minutes away at that time, about 20 minutes now, is Niagara Falls. Buffalo would be right over here on the upper uh, right side here, about 20 minutes away. We're looking at Niagara Falls from the Canadian side to the American side. This is the American Falls here. This is the Horseshoe Falls. And the reason that I show this slide is because Niagara Falls is 167 feet tall. And, you know, that's a pretty stunning sight, especially when you see it in person. Yet it would only come up to about here, about a third of the way up of the electric tower, which was the focal point of the 1901 Pan American Exposition. The electric tower was 399 feet tall. And it was amazing. You could see it from miles around. And the presenters of the Pan American Exposition wanted to showcase Buffalo's ability to harness electric power, which actually came from Niagara Falls. And that's why they had almost a quarter of a million light bulbs on the grounds of the Pan American Exposition. It was just a wonderful sight for those to see, especially if they'd never come across electricity before. So about Nine years ago, I took a bunch of those stamps that I had been saving since 1968 when I first became a collector, and I took the building stamps and I sorted them into five different colors, green, blue, red, brown, and purple. I must say that the purple ones are actually the hardest ones to find, and uh, but they're not that expensive. Uh, as I say, most of these are a dollar to four dollars a piece. The purples might be another dollar, but anyway, there are 20 images on these stamps. They, they say there's 20 building stamps, yet there's really 19 plus one of Niagara Falls. And in five different colors times 20 makes 100 different piles. So I sorted these. And uh, the more that I, I got into these stamps and tried to find out information about them and who was associated with them, I found out there were two men that distributed them or had their name associated with them. And these are them. The left is a, a guy named Rainer Hubble, born in Buffalo, New York, and he was a really good guy. This picture may not be so great, but this is the earliest known photograph of Rainer Hubble. And I actually found this at the APRL last year or just before uh, um, the end of 2019. The picture on the right shows William B. Hale. This is the fellow that was associated with the stamps that were on the right of the the uh, slide a little ways back, those Niagara Falls and building stamps. So the more that I got to uh, learn about these people, the more I thought, wouldn't it be neat, not only if I had this numbering system, but if I could also tell their stories as well. And I thought, well, okay, but now what do you do? How do you tell the stories of two men born in the 1870s that really were not famous people and yet they happen to be stamp dealers. Well, you wind up here in Belmont, Pennsylvania at the American Philatelic Center. And this is when I went there for the very first time in 2012. And 
everyone was wonderful. I was nicely welcomed and I was guided to the old American Philatelic Research Library. And I loved this place. I got there at eight o'clock in the morning on a Monday morning. And on this table was a nice stack of over 50 uh, items with a note that said for Mr. Barrett, I had emailed ahead and mentioned what my uh, project was about. And it was just a joy to arrive here. I loved this place. This was terrific. The stacks were great. And I mean, I wanted to move here. I wanted to live here. This was just wonderful. And I had been an APS member for many years. And yet, really, most of my involvement was really reading the magazine that came in the mail every month, the American Philatelist. So I learned from that visit that they, I could um, enjoy more aspects of the club. And that's when things really began to grow for me. I understood that I was able to check out some of the old stamp journals uh, from the APRL, and I could get five a, a month and read them and return them after four weeks. And so I started getting journals that they are actually bound uh, volumes of different monthly stamp journals from the 1880s. I took the 1890s out, uh, some in the early 1900s. It was a wonderful experience. My um, perception of the hobby grew in so many ways. Uh, there were average size ones like the Rhode Island Philatelists. There were very large volumes like McKeel's Weekly Stamp News. And there were tiny ones uh, that were just a very few pages. And so I would get these and I would go through these stamp journals, these bound volumes, page by page. And I was looking for anything I could find on either man. Rainer B. Hubble, or Rainer Hubble or William B. Hale. And what would happen is when I would find something, I would put a post-it note in it. And at the end of uh, the stack, when I'd gone through all five volumes, I would go down to the local copy store nearby in our neighborhood, and I would Xerox everything that had uh, information on either of those two men. And what I wound up with was piles like this. I would always... Um, Xerox what I had found of theirs, but I also Xeroxed the front page. Like here's the uh, Virginia Philatelist uh, from August 1900. And, but this way I could recall the volume number and which issue number. And that way I would be able to provide um, proper resourcing and footnotes um, whenever I was doing my writing. So I took these and, and some of these were just stapled with one uh, front page of a stamp journal and then an advertisement behind it or a letter to the editor or a mention that they had a catalog going out or sometimes a feature if I was really lucky. And um, so some of these would just be the front page of a journal with whatever I was able to find. And then I'd go home and I put them in two folders, one for Mr. Hubble, one for Mr. Hale. And I put them in there chronologically so I could begin to recreate the timeline of their lives. And it was just a thrill. I must say, um, I, by the time my project was over, I realized I had looked at over 50,000 pages of stamp journals and it was never work. It was always a labor of love. I, I didn't do this project for any money or recognition. It was just following my passion and my star and it was wonderful. And, uh, you know, when we saw those volumes here back a couple slides there, you know, there's only so many post-it notes and there's a lot of pages where nothing turned up, but it was wonderful still reading about things because I learned about other parts of our hobby. And here's King George V, the greatest royal philatelist. And I also learned about the smallest philatelist in the world who was only 31 inches tall. And uh, here's a fellow that I saw that was from South Africa that was coming over from uh, there to the United States to judge an exhibit. And I thought, boy, this guy certainly has the credentials to judge something. And uh, there were blurbs that were fun. Now, this one says the latest fad among some collectors, and to our mind, a very foolish one, is the collection of plate numbers. Well, we know what happened after that. Uh, and it, it reflects that a lot of the editors were very opinionated. There were hundreds and hundreds of different stamp journals in the 1890s. You gotta remember there's no internet, there was no TV, there was no radio, um, even movies really hadn't been around. And uh, so people enjoyed themselves through the written word. And there were a ton of stamp journals. Well, these editors sometimes were 
um, complementary of each other. And other times they just spoke their mind. I remember one uh, said, this uh, so-and-so uh, journal isn't worth the paper that it's printed on. So there were uh, just a variety of entertaining things that I would come across when reading these old stamp journals from the APRL. Here's a blurb, never disturb a stamp collector. He may be a genius at work. And uh, here's another one, sloppy stamp hinging and mounting make for a sloppy looking collection. Don't be a sloppy collector. So it was a blast reading these things. And uh, I then kind of shifted to, I, I understood that this would likely be more than just a pamphlet and it would likely be a book. So I decided to put some emphasis on what the title might be and what might it look like. And so my first mock-up was A Gentleman Huckster and Cinderella's at the Pan Am, and that's the Temple of Music artwork behind it. I then went to this image, and this does have uh, my final title and subtitle, Buffalo Cinderella's, The Gentleman, Rainer Hubble, and The Huckster, William B. Hale, and the Pan American Exposition. But I didn't use this as a cover, but I, excuse me, I did meet a fellow that uh, his grandfather had gone to the Pan American Exposition. And this fellow sold me a large three inch by five inch negative. This is an actual photo taken at the Pan Am, um, a black and white photo of the electric tower. There's a puddle there where people are walking along the esplanade. And uh, there are no color photographs of the Pan American Exposition, only black and white. And uh, so there are color maps, there are color postcards. So I, I love this image. And I had a, a gal that was a college student doing some graphic work for me. And I asked if she could somehow take some postcards of the electric tower that I had that were in color. And could she colorize this? And this is what she came up with. And this was the same uh, title that I got. And she flipped the image. You can see it's, it's gone to the other side here. But she took off the blemish at the top. She took out the puddle near those people. But this is a very true rendition of what the electric tower actually would have looked like. A lot of gold pastels there. And this is either gray or white. Um, but it was just stunning. And I did not use this as my cover, but I did use it as my back cover of my book. I just loved it so much. And I think she did a terrific job. So we got to the end of this part of the project and here's the cover that I chose that maybe you have seen before and the next thing I did after deciding on that was to buy promotional postcards. Now I, many people write their book and then they work on a cover and then they try and promote it. Well I kind of do things backwards once in a while and I uh, did all this stuff before I actually wrote the book so researching things and I said coming in 2016 and Actually, I wound up having to buy red stickers that said 2017 and putting them over these postcards because it just, uh, I kept finding more and more material to write about each of these men. So my next uh, order of business was to go back to the original idea to uh, working on, these are some of the Niagara Falls and Bridge and Whirlpool stamps associated with Mr. Uh, William B. Hale. And uh, so I worked with my stock pages and stock book and I, I played around with it a bit. And the next thing I did was go to a stamp show where I live in Houston, Texas. And I met this fellow. And this is Jonathan Topper of Topper Stamps. And, you know, when you go to a stamp show in Houston, many of the dealers and collectors there, they're all interested in Texas material, understandably. Well, Mr. Topper heard about my idea and the stamps and these people. And he said, you've got to tell the story. He said, go for it. And uh, he's become one of my, my great supporters and a big mentor. And uh, I so appreciate his help all along the path. And so we were working, uh, we would go to his office about every six weeks and we would talk about uh, stamps or I would bring stamps. And we talked about color varieties and, and the numbering system. And you know, then I started talking to other folks as well, of course. And if you ask a question, and you get the same answer from several people who don't even know each other, you really do need to follow up. And so with regard to the numbering system, who has had experience with that? So many people said, you need to go to the Collectors Club of New York. 
And this is where I went to in Manhattan. It's right near uh, Madison Avenue. And they have been in this structure since 1937. It used to be an art gallery. And uh, the club actually has been around since 1896. And my brother lived in Connecticut. And so I, I flew up to visit him. And I took the train into the city two mornings in a row. And I got to spend two days at the famous collector's club. Uh, it was such a treat. I had called in advance and to make sure this was uh, a, a good time to visit. And I was welcomed by this lady. Her name is Irene Bromberg, and she's the PhD executive secretary of the Collectors Club. And what a wonderful soul she is. She wanted to hear about my project and guide me however she could. She showed me the stacks where they have some of their books and uh, there and then she took me to the basement where they have a lot more um, in the stacks down there and it was wonderful and the second day that I was there I had some luck right in these stacks because that's where I found that picture of the huckster William B. Hale and I remember feeling so excited riding the train home that day because that has turned out to be the one of only two known photographs of William B. Hale that has ever surfaced and I found it at the Collectors Club of New York. So that was a terrific experience and visit as well. When I got home, I, I uh, by the way, I had also joined the Collectors Club when I was there, and uh, I could take out books from there as well. So I had books from the APRL, the Collectors Club. I was also getting books from the Rocky Mountain Philatelic Library, as well as the Western Philatelic Library. So I had all these boxes of volumes coming in. I had these huge lists that I was working off of, but this saved me so much time because I could go through five books, say, from the APRL and make my Xeroxes. When I was finished, um, I could send them back, but I still had books from the other libraries to work on because it takes a, a couple weeks or, or sometimes even three or more before they receive them, check them in, and then they... Um, send some more from the list that I'd included. So I was never without old stamp journals to go through, and it was just wonderful. So I realized um, that I was gathering information from the philatelic world, but I needed some more from history in Buffalo uh, with regard to the Pan American Exposition, because obviously that's the setting of, of these two fellows and their stamps and so I went here and it's the only one that remains from the 1901 Pan American Exposition. All of the other pavilions including the electric tower were made of either of wood or chicken wire and plaster and they were not meant to survive the harsh winters in Buffalo, New York. So the Buffalo History Museum is the only one that's left and back then during the expo, it was the New York State Pavilion. And I was uh, welcomed there by their archivist, Cynthia Van Ness, just a very friendly person. She gave me the white gloves and I got to go through a lot of photographs and, and um, rare books. And one of the biggest finds that I got on that trip there was finding Buffalo City directories that had mention of Mr. Hubble and his stamp business. This is from 1896, and he put an advertisement here, the Rainer Hubble Stamp Company, rare postage stamps. It appeared nice, big, and bold above the worm tablets advertisement, but he also got two free mentions above it. One, that he was the manager of Rainer Hubble Stamp Company at 22 Palace Arcade, but the first one there also mentioned his home at 172 Franklin Street. So his retail outlet was actually the first uh, ever in the city of Buffalo for the uh, buying, selling, and exchanging of stamps. This is the Palace Arcade as it looked back then. Here is how it looks today. And this is on Main Street, and Mr. Hubble had a storefront here. Actually, over time, his business was so good, he would have a second storefront as well. And uh, the people that came on Main Street would go through this entranceway all the way out the other side of the building because on the other side was a huge, absolutely gigantic outdoor market, and people came from all around the state, from New York City, Albany, Syracuse, Rochester by train, and they would go to this outdoor market. And so the people that came from the Main Street side would walk right past Rainer Hubble Stamp Company, 
And that's how he got a lot of business. So after I visited this place, I went down Franklin Street and I found where Rainer Hubble lived with his family. This is 172 Franklin Street and they lived upstairs here in this apartment. Today, it's been divided into two apartments, very nice one, but the whole Hubble family lived there. His mom, his dad, his brother, his sister, and his cousin. And uh, for many incarnations, it's been above a pub in Buffalo. So it was really nice to get some perspective on Mr. Hubble and where he lived. And as his business grew and his uh, the Pink and Exposition got closer, he moved further down Main Street, which actually isn't very far from home here. He moved to the Ellicott Square building. And it's just a majestic place, 10 story office building. And when it opened in 1896, it was the largest office building in the entire world. And it remained that way for 12 years. And this was a very famous place. It had two banks of elevators. It had its own security force. It had telephone service, which in the 1890s was a big deal. It was just from office to office within the building, but it was a big deal. And um, 3,500 people worked there. And 15,000 people a day came through the lobby of the Ellicott Square Building. There were four retail outlets in the lobby and I believe that Mr. Hubble had this one right here. It was right near the entranceway to the bank of elevators. Um, experience to connect with the uh, administrative assistant um, of the, the owner at the Ellicott Square building. And they let me look at a scrapbook that was found in the basement that was from the early 1900s. And so it was such a treat to meet her and meet the owner and, and find information about Rainer Hubble in that scrapbook. It was a real treat. So um, from there, I was excited to uh, take my memories with me and head back to Belfont, Pennsylvania. And right over here is the Match Factory Campus, the home of the APRL and uh, the APS, the American Philatelic Center. And uh, I got to go back to the old uh, APRL, the old research library, which, um, and I was assisted by our good friend, Scott Tipney, who is now the head librarian at the APRL. And Scott also told me um, about the new or current uh, research library and what it would look like. And boy, if you've not been there, it is terrific. It is state of the art. It is comfortable, it is beautiful, it is so easy to do research in. There's over 40,000 volumes there. And again, I just wish I could live there. It's just a treat. So um, I look forward to going back there sometime very soon, hopefully this year. There's my APS uh, membership card from eight, 1982. And uh, when I was there, I found uh, this book by Colonel William Kenyon. And he was a postal inspector for 40 years. And when he published his uh, autobiography in the early 60s, he had a chapter at the end on Mr. William B. Hale. And William B. Hale was characterized by Inspector Kenyon as one of the most egregious criminals that I ever encountered. And uh, the story is absolutely fascinating. And uh, Inspector Kenyon, now, now the story is, is that William B. Hale, and this is a true story, he was washing cancellations off of stamps and then regumming them and then selling them in quantity to businesses that used a lot of postage. And he would sell them for less than face value. So he had a not just a small business going, he was incarcerated for a year and a day once and he didn't learn his lesson. So he got out of prison in Massachusetts and began doing it on a scale never before done by anyone else. He made over a million dollars a year. And that's why the post office department and Inspector Kenyon were trying to find William B. Hale so badly. Well, they eventually did in March of 1929. And it was actually front page news across the country that they, uh, uh, a ring of uh, you know, 
those that were washing canceled stamps had been arrested. It was picked up by the Associated Press here. This is the AP, and this was mentioned in May, but the arrest was in late March. And it mentions here William H. Hale. I believe that uh, someone was uh, transcribing a handwritten message of William B. Hale and just got it wrong, but this was front page news. And he wound up in the federal pen penitentiary. They uh, found him guilty for a second time. And so the next thing that I found, there wasn't a lot in stamp journals. I believe this uh, arrest, the second arrest was mentioned in McKeel's and Lynn's stamp news and uh, maybe the American philatelist, if, if I recall. But after that, uh, there was no mention of William B. Hale for a long time. I, I also tried to find a uh, mention of him in conventional press through newspapers.com, Googling things, Google books, and I didn't have any luck until I found this stamp journal, again, at the APRL, it's called Postal Markings. This is from December of 1936, and it's the first of a three-part series that goes into January and February of 1937. Well, the author of this series or this feature uh, shows a variety of forgeries, including these cancellations. And he said that William B. Hale died in federal penitentiary in 1935 and when he was arrested they found a whole bunch of canceling devices in his cell and this story was uh, reported in a variety of stamp journals and books after that but uh, it just seemed very odd i could not find anything really definitive and i got to thinking this uh, mystery needs to be investigated further. And I will say that the last chapter of my book solves the mystery. It's really fun and intriguing, but it took some work. And um, so uh, I, I said, how do you get some more information about um, arrests or their death or something like that? And I was guided to the National Archives. And they said, you need to put in a request. And we all may have heard the, the phrase, a, about a Freedom of Information Act request. And frankly, I thought that that was just something that, uh, you know, people on TV would do for the news and it was hard. Well, no, you just go to the website and, and fill out a form and pay the fee and tell them what you're looking for and they'll go and look for it. And if it's there, you'll get presented with it. And I got, whoops, I got uh, 300 pages from the Department of Justice uh, a lot of it from the post office department at the time. Here we go. This is from um, March of 1930, which is all, just a couple weeks short of a year after William B. Hale was arrested the second time. This is actually his um, attorney, Mr. Crossland. But it was great to find all of this extra material and confirm some things that were erroneously reported before that. So I needed some more help. So where do you go? It's 2016. If you're still looking to follow uh, some leads and, and uh, get to the end of these stories. And I wound up at the International uh, Stamp Expo, New York 2016. And this was, this is every 10 year event where people come from around the world and uh, they both dealers and collectors alike. This is at the Javits Center in New York City. And Here's some of the floor. Look at the size of that post office department, uh, USPS exhibit alone. And it was terrific. And I met a lot of people that were interested in Cinderella's. I asked about Raymond Hubble and William B. Hale and got some leads there. And it was just a terrific experience. And if you uh, exhibit stamps, check out these frames. There's over 4,000 frames that were uh, being shown there over a nine day period. Heck, it would take you nine days to look at all these frames. I believe it took four or five days just for volunteers to set these up. So it was an amazing experience to be at New York 2016. I also got to see the world's rarest stamp, the one cent British Guiana. Uh, it was on loan from this fellow who actually is going to be auctioning it off next month. But uh, this is in an acrylic case, and I asked a guard standing right next to it if I could take a picture, and he said, sure, as long as you 
uh, don't use a flash. So it was a lot of fun to see in person the rarest stamp in the world there. And uh, my late brother had a good time during the days we went. He tried to do a deal for a million dollar sheet. Uh, he wasn't successful, but he had a good time trying. And uh, on the last day that I was to attend New York 2016, I came down the elevator at the hotel I was at, and who would I see but Mr. Topper? And what a treat that was. He and his lovely wife were there, and we took a taxi over to the Javits Center together and looked around and then uh, had a nice lunch together. So all these experiences were just out of the blue and, and, and just a, a terrific time just because of stamp collecting. So uh, when I got home, I realized I had so much more to uncover and write and that I needed to push my date back. And I announced on social media that Buffalo Cinderella's would come out in 2017 because of a massive research push, which caused rescheduling. Now, we mentioned that Mr. Uh, William B. Hale was a huckster, and he burned his bridges in 1905 because, well, frankly, he ripped people off, and uh, he couldn't advertise in the philatelic journals anymore because people knew he was a fraud. So what did he do? He became a postcard distributor, and these are some of the postcards with his name, William B. Hale, or W. B. Hale, or W. M. B. Hale, on the other side of these. And they're either small town images or a lot of uh, nature scenes, all from central Massachusetts. They're not rare. And I, I've accumulated just over 200 and I have a list of about another 125. And so I, I wound up at the largest postcard show in New England, which is held in Boston once a year. And one time I found 53 postcards of William B. Hale there. Another time I found almost 70. And my guess is there's probably around 500 that are associated with William B. Hale. So on one of my trips to Massachusetts, I went to central Massachusetts to his hometown where he lived all his life when he was not traveling. And that's Hubbardston, Massachusetts. It's a very small town. It's also uh, incorporated uh, with Williamsville, which is part of Hubbardston. And so I went there, there's only 4,000 people there, and I was allowed or graced to meet with members of their historical society. And they were really nice folks and they heard about my project and, and they uh, were excited for me and gave me a few ideas. And you never know who you're gonna meet when uh, this project uh, sends you on your way. And you know, the B in William B. Hale stands for Bennett. And the Bennetts and the Hales were affluent families, especially in the 1800s. And even in this small town, there's a lot of things that have Bennett on them or Hale on them, including street signs. So this is Hale Road Extension. And at the corner of Hale Road Extension and Williamsville Road happens to be Forest Hill Cemetery. And I went there on a Sunday morning and I found the Hale family plot. And William B. Hale is in here somewhere. We don't know exactly where, but I got a lot of support in advance and the day that I went there from the curator of the cemetery. And his name's Paul Sweeney, just a, a, a great guy. And the uh, afternoon that we met, I brought with me an old map from the 1800s that shows Williamsville and the town of Hubbardston, this little 4,000 member town at the time even. Now this horizontal road from left to right or right to left, that's Williamsville Road. In fact, the cemetery is over here just out of sight on the right. But if we look at it, here is a store and a post office with the name S.P.H. Hale. Now that's William B. Hale's dad, Seth P.H. Hale. He was the postmaster. He was an American Express agent, which helped the townsfolk. And he was also justice of peace. So he lived down West Williamsville Road here, right here, the home of S.P.H. Hale across the street lived William B. Hale. So Mr. Sweeney, Paul Sweeney, the uh, cemetery curator, uh, rode around with me and he was a big help. And he said, this is where the general store was. Now we don't know whether this is the actual dwelling that's just been refurbished, but he did say, 
that that is definitely the original chimney. That's well over 120 or 30 years old. So interesting to um, be exposed to that. Here down the street is Seth P.H. Hale's home as uh, redone, beautiful home actually. And then across the street is William B. Hale's house. And we got to meet the uh, fellow that lives there now with his family and uh, told him about her project. And he said, you need to meet my neighbor. She is really into the history of our town and maybe she can help you. And he did say that when they remodeled the kitchen there, they took the plaster off of the wall and there was a wooden wall. And wouldn't you know it in pencil, William B. Hale had written his name on the wall. And uh, we got a laugh out of that. So Paul Sweeney and I got in the car. We drove down the road a little ways to the next home out in the country here. And we knocked on the door. And wouldn't you believe this couple, lovely couple, welcomed us inside. They didn't know who we were. Paul dropped a few names. So they had some familiarity with uh, the mutual friends. And they invited us in on a Sunday afternoon. and. They were just so happy to see people and share about their town. It was such a joy to meet them. And uh, they were excited about the project. She said that you need to talk to her, my best friend because her best friend writes a column in the little town newspaper every week, a historical column. So it was a joy to meet with them. And they brought out a book called Hubbardston Mass Illustrated from 1899. And this is a picture of William B. Hale's dad, Seth. So uh, just a, a wonderful experience. And I did get to meet that lady's best friend. Her name is Jane. And I met her a couple years later when I was invited to speak at the Hubbardston Historical Society after my book came out. So, you know, I, I have great friends all because of this uh, travel and, and uh, this experience. And I never dreamt any of this would unfold. So when I got back home, I, be, I wound up here. And this is the M.D. Anderson Library on the campus of the University of Houston. And this is from 2017. And I would get up at 5 in the morning, and I'd go to Starbucks at 5.30, and I would end up here at the library at 6 o'clock. And uh, it's 24 hours, actually, but I wound up there at 6 a.m. and uh, I would start typing and no not on a Blickensdurfer number five and this came from one of those old 1890s stamp journals but I did uh, type on my laptop here at this cubicle and I wound up here every day. Now uh, finals had already finished so there wasn't a lot of um, attendance from students there but I, I went there over the next 10 weeks and I went to the library 22 times and I would stay from 6 a.m. till about 6 p.m. and uh, I made friends with the security guy there that was a lot of fun I would eat lunch on the campus of the University of Houston and uh, over those 22 days I, I computed it that uh, I had averaged 10 hours and 10 and a half hours per visit so that's where Buffalo Cinderella's was written and at this time as well, this spring, I put an advertisement in this magazine because towards the latter part of his life, Mr. Rainer Hubble had become a specialist in Civil War stamps and covers. And so I put an advertisement in this magazine saying, I'm writing the life story of Rainer Hubble and wonder if you could help with any materials or if anyone might have known Rainer Hubble. And so I didn't really get any response for quite a while. And about eight weeks later, I get a telephone call one night. And this man said, I knew Rainer Hubble. I met him several times. And so it was just a thrill to be able to listen to him and hear his stories. He said that his dad would take him to stamp shows and uh, in New Jersey. And Mr. Hubble would arrive with this giant circus trunk of stamp albums and, and wares. And his dad would, uh, this fellow's dad would go and buy, shop for stamps, buy from dealers. And uh, while he was away, Rainer Hubble uh, allowed this man as a teenager to sit on the circus trunk with him all weekend. And uh, 
he said it was great. And he wound up uh, watching the table when Mr. Hubble needed to do a deal or something. Uh, he said Mr. Hubble would give them money for hot dogs for lunch. And uh, it was just great to have a human interest aspect of this person that I was writing about. Obviously, we couldn't do that with William B. Dale, but we could do it with Rainer Hubble. And anyway, this man uh, said, you need to go to the APS Summer Show. And it was being held that year in Richmond, Virginia. This is 2017. And he said, that there's a good chance that a couple other people who knew Rainer Hubble may show up there and you may not have that many more opportunities because Mr. Hubble died in 1961 which was 60 years ago today. So uh, anyone that actually met him is probably gonna be in their 80s or 90s now. So I was very fortunate to um, connect with this fellow. And I went to the summer show and I uh, registered there. And uh, this is where I got to meet this fellow I'm speaking of. And I cannot emphasize what a kind, kind man he is. His name is James Monroe, Jim Monroe. and. Uh, he loved hearing about my project, a soft-spoken guy who had collected stamps for decades and was happy to introduce me to other people who could also be allies to me. And so the next day, we wound up going to a banquet together here uh, at the a gathering of the Civil War Philatelic Society. It was the CSA at that time. And uh, so I got to meet other collectors of the same material that Mr. Hubble specialized in. And yes, I met a couple other people that had met Rainer Hubble. And uh, one of the people at that table was the secretary of the uh, club. In fact, his name is on this uh, mail out back here and uh, right here, Larry Baum. And he was the secretary of the club at the time. And so Larry Baum and I were chatting the next morning at the stamp show. And he said, did you meet so-and-so yet? And I said, no, I, I don't know who you're referring to. And he said, why don't uh, you come with me? And he walked with me all across the floor of this convention center for a good 15 minutes. And finally, just before this fellow was to leave the show, uh, we located him and I will forever be indebted to Larry Baum, who's now president of the club actually, uh, for that experience. That was a miracle, and I'll tell you why. Because the fellow that I met had also known Rainer Hubble. He had received 35 letters from Rainer Hubble when he was a young, and Mr. Hubble helped him with that. And so this man took 35 letters and had them all bound into this um, journal, and he mailed it to me, and I was able to have it for six weeks and transcribed what I could and use the information in my book when I was in the library there writing Buffalo Cinderella's. So that was a miracle. That was amazing. Had I not connected with uh, Larry Baum and had he not walked with me around the convention center, and we found that guy just before he was to leave and this would not have happened. It was just amazing. And I'll tell you, 15 minutes after this occurred, another one did too. And I wound up at the uh, booth of the American Philatelic Society. In fact, there's Ken Martin right there. And um, so right here at this table, right over on the side, was Chris Kelly. You may know the name, and his dad, Paul Kelly, had been involved in uh, artwork and stamps for years earlier. And so I was having a conversation with uh, someone nearby and uh, right at Chris's table, and Chris was helping a customer. And when Chris was reaching down into a box to get something for this customer, as I'm conversing with this other fella, I see that Chris pulls something out of this box and sets it on the counter. And I just stopped and said, Chris, holy grail. And this is what I saw. And Chris said, well, let's finish up with, uh, you know, who we're connecting with. And, and we'll then chat. And we did. And he said, so what's going on with this is amazing. This is the largest intact block ever uncovered of the building stamps. 25 uh, stamps are in this block. I've had blocks of 20. And Chris actually had a green one and a blue one. But when we looked closely, the perforations had separated. So I have those as well. But they're essentially blocks of 10 and blocks of 15. But this is the 
intact block of 25 stamps. And I'm so grateful that I could get this and picture it in my book. So what an amazing miracle that was. And I had not been there at that moment and just standing there. And, and if he, he hadn't reached into that box looking for something and just, you know, set it down, I wouldn't have known what was in that box and I might never have found this. So that was another awesome miracle. Anyhow, I went home after the show and I started to work again with Mr. Topper and I was working on the stamp appendix for the back of my book. There's 24 pages where all 202 varieties of Pan American Exposition related Cinderella's from these two men are pictured in full color. And Mr. Topper and I didn't go through hundreds of stamps. We went through thousands of stamps to check on the colors and different varieties. And we, you know, this is a common charging Buffalo stamp, uh, but, and it's easy to note that uh, the overprints uh, will, you know, make these two stand out, but we didn't know that there's actually four different plates of those others. And that was terrific. And uh, those are pictured in the appendix in my book. And uh, here's a couple of pages for that. And yes, all of the stamps in the appendix have numbers. Here's William B. Hale's stamps there. And uh, it was a joy to finish things up with this appendix so that other collectors could hopefully put together sets if they chose to. At this time, all of the files went to the printers and uh, in uh, Iowa, Wilcox Printing, and uh, they were terrific people. They done philatelic publishing before, uh, they were attentive to all details in a philatelic book, and they were great. And after uh, about four or five weeks, they had said, we printed your pages, we sent them to the bindery, and we've got the books back from the binder, ready to go. And a few days later, they all arrived in Houston, where I live. Here they are. This is the big day. When they arrived, 350 copies of Buffalo Cinderella. And I was ecstatic. After six years, I could finally see the finished product. I was just in heaven. It was just such an amazing ordeal. And, and uh, holding it was just terrific. I announced it on social media. That was a lot of fun. Uh, just being able to hold it and have others hold it. It was great. What an amazing experience it was. And I signed a bunch of book plates so that there could be signed and numbered copies. And what better place than to unveil the book but in Buffalo, New York, where I was invited by the Buffalo Stamp Club to share at their annual Buff Pex show. And what a treat that was. I'm so grateful to all the members of the Buffalo Stamp Club. They're so kind and, and welcoming. And I had a lot of fun there. And I also got to speak at the Buffalo History Museum on the same trip. So uh, all these unexpected things just came my way. And another one that unfolded of just a matter of months later was a gold medal was awarded for my book for philatelic writing. And I wasn't able to attend the show, but a member of our Houston Philatelic Society, Ron Strasser, brought the medal back and, and uh, presented it to me at one of our Houston Philatelic Society meetings. So all these things occurred that were unexpected and, and just a thrill. So in closing, my hope for you is that if you have any type of philatelic passion, a part of the hobby that you really connect with or gravitate to, no matter how big or wild or small or even mundane, then please don't be a lone wolf collector. This is an APS notice in a 1950 stamp journal that says, taint any fun collecting alone, hiding behind closed doors, keeping out of touch with the philatelic world, let light shine into your hobby den through membership in the world's largest collecting organization, the American Philatelic Society. So please, if there's a part of the hobby that you're passionate about, then please consider sharing it in some way, however you might feel drawn to. Whatever you be most comfortable with. You, you don't have to write a book. You can do an exhibit or share something with your stamp club or, or write an article for a club newsletter or magazine. Heck, pretty much all of the philatelic papers would love to receive a submission from you, no matter how long or detailed or whatever. And don't worry about spelling or grammar or anything. That's what they've got editors for. So my wish for you 
is that you share something you enjoy with others and get the gifts that come from it, as well as giving back to our awesome hobby. You can do it. I know it. And if you need a little nudge of support, it's definitely out there. I have so many awesome adventures and you can too. So anyway, I want to thank you so much for your time and for listening to my story. I always love to connect with people. So here's my email address, as well as my book's Facebook page, which is still going. And if you're moved to, you can purchase Buffalo Cinderella's from the APS or Amazon or eBay. And now I'll turn things back over to Heidi. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. Thanks so much. I'm catching my breath, Rick. That was phenomenal. Let me first be the one to say, what a great tale. And when you when you started at the top of your story using the term odyssey, you were not, I mean, you were not being hyperbolic one bit. You nailed it. There were so many things that I was just like a kid in a candy store, you know? It's like, well, okay. I mean, finding that one picture of William B. Hale, you know, in the whole scheme of things now, as I look back, that's just one little part. But boy, that day I was on top of the world. And there were so many things like that. And it, it was a joy to be on this ride. And, and your, your documentation of the, of the Odyssey is really yes. spectacular. You, you, re you really thought about it. I mean, it, well, it, for I, I was, I'm glad that I took those pictures. I didn't really start my social media involvement with the book until probably around maybe 2016. And I had, but I was able to find that I had taken a lot of pictures before that. And uh, that was great. So I could share this path that I'd been on with others. And, and boy, it was, it was great. It was well, great. So and that's and that's what I find so um, so great about this presentation, Rick, is that uh, often we'll get we'll get people you know emailing uh, you know how to do certain things, particularly philatelic research, sure. um, and you know you kind of have to you you pick and choose. But what you have done here for philatelic literature and how to write it. It, it laid it all out from how long it took, where, because people want to know, okay, when you're writing, what's the best place? Like you, this is, this was the, great. The thing that, that, that I want to share for people that might, you know, be moved to, you know, share their own passion is that, you know, I just went with it at the beginning. And, you know, like they say, you can drive across the country at night from Los Angeles to New York in however many days. And, you know, but your lights don't shine across the country. They shine 40 or 50 feet in front of you, but that's all you need. And I didn't need to have a roadmap that went uh, from 2012 to the end of the book. I wound up just saying, just do the next thing. And I just stayed within that next 30 or 40 feet. And it's like, okay, I'll get these journals. Okay, I'll go here. Okay, I'll learn about this. And it was great. It was great. And this is what it ended up with. Yes, I'm speechless. Miraculous, uh, Odyssey, it, you, your words, I don't know if I've ever heard them so succinctly used. So we'll get to some questions. Uh, oh, we do have a friend that's saying, I own the book and it's great. And it's so nice to hear the story behind it, indubitably. So we have our first question. A philatelic vanity press currently buys half page ads in some stamp bulletins and journals. What do you think of using philatelic vanity press to publish personal philatelic research. So does that mean to promote a project or to say that you're looking to find uh, information so you can write something? Mm, well, uh, to the- I mean, I Fred guess I, I used the, the philatelic press both ways. Uh, I didn't have a lot of resources um, to put ads out like I did in that one magazine saying, did you know Mr. Hubble? But, um, but uh, you know, I did go for that. Um, and then subsequently, uh, you know, whether one has, uh, you know, some ability to market or whatever, 
um, you can either pay for ads after publication. Um, I chose to uh, do some of that and also um, graciously received the help from the APS. It's been available there. And frankly, if you buy it there, then they get a portion of it, which is terrific and helps the hobby. Exactly. Uh, and it, you, when you were speaking about the, your, the press that you used, it was Wilcox, right? Yes. Right. So unfortunately, you know, we had a, a little bit of an internet issue. So would you just talk briefly uh, about that, you know, when you chose Wilcox and they were super helpful, right? Sure. I'd actually, yeah, I'd actually had another printer in mind for several years. I had a folder with uh, that I was going to use them. And so as I got closer, I had this graphic artist that was assisting me with images and, um, you know, cropping things and whatever. And uh, so anyway, she said, you need to make sure that whoever is printing your book is providing you with a true uh, realization that the colors are true. And so she said, let's uh, submit uh, files to them and uh, ask for a, uh, a proof. And so we sent a whole 20 pages worth of color images to them and uh, we paid for it and we got them back and they just weren't true. They weren't accurate. And so I was like, wow, I'm so glad we did that because I don't want a book that uh, you know isn't going to represent well. And so then I asked others in the uh, philatelic community, what should I do? You know, where did you go to get your book published? Because and, and basically I found some books that I liked and I just asked those authors. And I, that's how I got guided to Wilcox. And they had done a handful of other philatelic publications and they could get the, the uh, color issue down pat. And uh, mm -hmm. they were reliable. They're a three generation family, uh, hands-on work. They were great. So I highly endorse them. Oh, I, I'm happy then that I, that we, we touched on that because to to get that true color. Yeah. Rick, about the Hale Imperf proofs or essay stamps, how many different kinds and or colors are there? Thanks. Um, off the, that's actually one uh, area that I did not have the ability to share the images in the stamp appendix. I only know uh, two people that own uh, William B. Hale imperfs. And off the top of my head, I believe there's four colors. Uh, there might be five. I can check on that. But um, uh, they are, there's only the two images. There's the Niagara Falls and the Whirlpool. So that suggests, I think there is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at what I forget after I uh, wrote the book. But um, uh, I believe that there are five colors. Um, blue, purple, green, brown, uh, and maybe red. Um, and anyway, and I thankfully have acquired a set of those. So there's three people that I know of on the planet that have those. They're so scarce. And had I been able to picture them when I went to press, I certainly would have put that in the back. But that's the only uh, thing that has come up since printing that uh, I've found um, that really would have gone in there. So great question. And thank you, Mike. Well, and nevertheless, uh, we you just sold a book during this stamp chat. Thank you to Foster Miller, who is with the American First Day Cover Society. Thanks so much. And by buying Buffalo Cinderella, as Rick said, uh, you will be supporting the EPS and the APRL. Uh, was the exposition considered a world's fair of the time? And what specifically drew you to collecting Cinderella's from this exposition? Well, yes, it's considered a World's Fair. Uh, the prior World's Fair that was called a World's Fair was in 1893 in Chicago. Now there's also uh, the Paris Exposition of 1900, a year before the Pan Am, and that too is considered a World's Fair. But um, uh, in, in the way, reason I say this is because when I have several books on World's Fairs, they're always included in there. Um, as far as how did I get interested in them? Well, as a Youngster, I uh, worked in a stamp store for three years and I saw these uh, building stamps in penny boxes and uh, collections would come into the stamp store and they'd be behind the revenue stamps because there was nowhere else to put them. And I liked them because they were colorful, they were neat, they uh, pertained to Buffalo 
And so I just started stashing whatever I could. And that's how I got so many. And then I later learned of uh, the Mr. Hale associated Cinderella's as well. So it, it was fun. What a journey. And uh, finally, uh, Rick, your passion for the hobby is infectious. Got me thinking about several pot projects I had considered in the past and laid them aside. It may be time. Thanks for a great presentation. Isn't that how we, that, that's, that's for you. That's the gold. You know, I said before I, I logged on, if there's one person that would be interested in following through and, you know, contributing something to the hobby and if they're able to, you know, learn more about the uh, research aspect of things or the APRL or others, uh, that's great because however we can get involved in it, it does ripple out in some way. It ripples out when we tell our friends, even our non-stamp collecting friends, and uh, it just uh, creates a, a spotlight on our hobby, and that's, that's a good thing. So thank you for following up. I hope you do. It, it's a spot where light on the hobby, it also the camaraderie, the fellowship, the networking that comes through the hobby. You, bravo, bravo, truly, Thank truly, you. truly. Well, I, I, I would love for you to take a moment and read uh, your accolades in the chat box, friends. If you uh, would please join me in thanking Mr. Rick Barrett. Um, uh, to our audiences here on Zoom and Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. I don't know how you couldn't. Uh, it was just phenomenal. And I really appreciate your time, Rick. Uh, the passion truly is infectious. I'm going, <laughs> it's great. So please be sure to, uh, if you haven't bought uh, Buffalo Cinderella's, please do look uh, for it on stamps.org. You'll be supporting the APRL and uh, uh, Rick's beloved APS and ours as well, right? Um, he will, if you're looking for more great stamp chats by Rick Barrett, uh, you can go to stamps.org and we're in the videos or you can find them on the APS YouTube channel. Stamp Chat is a production of the American Philatelic Society with memberships starting at just $25. You can join 135 years of international fellowship in the hobby and start taking advantage of member benefits now like the APRL. Whether you're researching, shopping on Stamp Store or renewing your membership, it's stamps.org. Thanks for joining us. You'll find this and more Stamp Chats on the APS YouTube channel like, subscribe, and use the comment box below to keep the conversation going. Until our next stamp chat, connect, collect, learn, and be inspired. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, on stamps.org, the American Philatelic Society, social since 1886. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Great job. Great.